Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you keep our hearts and minds open as we listen to the words of Dr. King, an acumen of deep devotion and abiding service through the applications of faith, nonviolent direct action. Amen. Have you ever been in jail? Don't answer that. I just want you to think with me what it would be like. Well, Dr. King was arrested nearly 30 times. One time for driving 30 in a 25 mile per hour zone that cost him $100 to get out. His arrest in Birmingham was his 13th and consequently, it was his most important arrest. So on April the 12th, 1963, Reverend King and 50 of his associates were jailed in Birmingham, Alabama, where he was imprisoned and placed in solitary confinement as a participant in nonviolent direct action demonstration against segregation there. A trusted admirer slipped a local newspaper into King jail cell containing a public comments of concerns and caution that were written by eight white Alabama religious leaders, forcing concern and caution that King should take his case to the court instead of an unwise, untimely protest in the streets. Dr. King wrote in longhand a 7,000 word letter in response without any research material to rely on that demonstrated his breadth and depth of learning. Quoting individual ranging from Socrates to St. Thomas Aquinas John Bunyan, the prophet Amos, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, Lincoln, Jefferson, to the sitting at that time Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren. In a passionate and persuasive response that came to be known as his letter from the Birmingham jail. Before the dream, there was the letter. He turned the criticism back upon both the nation religious leaders and more moderate white American, rebuking them for standing aloof on the sideline while kings and his followers risked their very lives and health fighting for social justice and equality. The sermon today would be excerpt from that letter presented in, in language of the day as King wrote them, followed by some reflection from me. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your most recent statement caught in our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideals. If I sought to answer all the criticism that come across my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day. And I would find myself with little time to, to do constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticism are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement, what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for being in Birmingham since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I am here because 
I have some organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little village and carried their thus says the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometown, just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom far beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I am constantly responding to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happened in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provisional outsider's agitator idea anywhere in the country. No one can never be considered an outsider anywhere in the United States. You deplore the demonstration that our president is taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the condition that brought the demonstration into being. I am sure that each of you will want to go beyond the superficial social analysts who look merely at effects and do not grapple with underlying causes. I would not hesitate to say that it is unfortunately that the so-called demonstration are taking place in Birmingham. But I would say in more empathetic terms that it is even more unfortunate that the white power structure of this city left the Negro community with no other alternative. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that racial injustice engulfed this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. An ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes, and of course, the notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than any other city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of these, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiations, several promises were made by the merchant, such as promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the windows. On the basis of these promises, an agreement will call for a moratorium on any types of demonstration. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victim of a broken promise. The signs remain, as in so many experiences of the past, we were confronted 
with blasted hopes and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we were present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved, so we decided to go through a process of self-purification, where we started having workshop on non-vital and repeatedly asked ourselves the question, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to set our direct action program around Easter Sunday, which was the Good Friday, realizing that with the exception of Christmas, this was the largest shopping period of the year, knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action. We thought that this was the best time to bring pressure on the merchant for the needed changes. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marshes, and so forth? Is it negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such created tension that a community that had consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue that can no longer be ignored. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructed non-violent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so the individual could rise from the bondage of myth and half-truth to the unfeathered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having non-violent gap flies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis-packed that will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged group seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as Reinhold Niebuhr had reminded us, groups are more and more than individual. We know through painful experiences that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well timed according to the timetables of those who have not suffered unduly from the, from the disease of segregation. 
for years and now I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for a God-given and constitutional rights. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mob lynch your mothers and your fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty, in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six years old daughter where she cannot go to the public amusement park they had just opened and advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by consciously developing a bitterness toward white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking an agonizing petas, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel would accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging sign reading white and colored, when your first name becomes and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and when your wife and your mother are never given the respected title, Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never knowing what to expect next, and plagued with interferes and out of resentment when you are forever fighting a degenerating and degrading nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatient. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. 
a just law. Is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts the human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives a segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. To use the word of Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, segregation substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating person to the fattest of things. So segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, but it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillichus has said that sin is separation. Isn't segregation an existential expression of man tragic? Separation, an expression of his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. Let us turn to a more concrete example of just and unjust law. An unjust law is a code that a majority inflicts on a minority that is not binding on itself. Let me give another example. An unjust law is a code inflicted upon a minority which that minority has no part in enacting or creating because it did not have the unhampered right to vote. Throughout the state of Alabama, all types of conniving methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. There are some counties without a single Negro registered to vote, despite the fact that the Negroes constitute a majority of the population. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was seen sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar because a higher moral law was involved. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and excruciating pain of shopping blocks before submitting to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced social disobedience. In our own country, the Boston Tea Party represented it, a massive act of civil disobedience. I must make two honest confession to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached a regrettable conclusion that the Negro great stumbling block and that strive toward freedom and not the white citizen counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order 
than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who feel that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises a Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shadow understanding from people of goodwill and more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance and much more bewildering than outright rejection. Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical devings precipitated the misguided popular mind to make him drink the hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to his will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? You spoke of our activities in Birmingham as it screamed. I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. Now, this approach is being dismissed as extremist. I gradually gain a bit of satisfaction for being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness a mighty scream. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus Christ and bear in my body the mark of the Lord Jesus? Was not Martin Luther and the screamers, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Was not John Bunyan in the screamers? I would stay in jail to end on my days before I make a mockery of my conscience. Was not Abraham Lincoln in the screamers? This nation cannot live half slave and half free. Was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We hold the truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we would be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate, or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice, or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? I had hoped that the white moderate would see this. Maybe I was too optimistic. I guess I should have realized that few members of a race that had oppressed another race can understand or appreciate the deep groan and passionate yearning of those that have been oppressed. And still feel how the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers have grasped the meaning of this social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still all too small in quantity, but they are big in quality. Let me rush on to mention my other disappointment. I have been disappointed with the white church and its leadership 
Of course, there are some notable exceptions. I am not unmindful of the fact that each of you had taken some significant stance on this issue. I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I say it as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessing, and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall sustain me. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be some of our strongest allies. Instead, some few have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dream of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leaders of this community will see the justice of our cause and with deep and more concern serve as a channel through which our just grievances could get to the power structure. I have hoped that each of you will understand, but again, I have been disappointed. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are presently misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Before the pilgrim landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson scratched across the pages of history, the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. For more than two centuries, our four parents labor here without wages. They made cotton king, and they built the homes of their master in the midst of brutal injustice and shameful humiliation, and yet out of a bottomless vitality, our people continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelty of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demand. I must close now, but before I do, I am impelled to mention one other point in your statement that troubles me profoundly. You warmly commended the Birmingham Police Force for keeping order and preventing violence. I don't believe you will have so warmly commended the police force. You have seen an ugly, angry, violent dog literally biting six unarmed, non-violent Negroes. I don't believe you were so quickly commend the policeman if you would observe the ugly and inhuman treatment of Negro here in the city jail. If you would watch them push and curse old Negro women and young Negro girls, if you would see them slap 
and kick old Negro men and young boys. And you would have observed them as they did on two occasions, refusing to give us food because we want to sing our grace together. I am sorry, I can't join you in your praise for the police department. I wish you had commended the Negro demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of the most inhuman provocation. If I have said anything in this letter that is an understatement of the truth and is indicative of an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me if I have said anything in this letter that is an overstatement of the truth and is indicative of my having a patient that makes me patient with anything less than brotherhood. I beg God to forgive me. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. Some reflection and some personal reflection. I was born and raised in the South. My state was alleged to be the most progressive state in the South during the era of the Civil Rights Movement. It was difficult for me to acknowledge that claim when 16 years following the passage of the 1954 Supreme Court ruling that racial segregation of children in public school was unconstitutional, my school still was segregated. I finally experienced the attempt at implementing that order in my senior year in high school when we were bused to an all-white high school literally right across the railroad track. And the white student, instead of coming to our school, elected to attend all-white academy. Parents were still fighting school integration. Sisters and brothers in Christ, now is the time for effective, fair, and legitimate racial justice implementation of all types and all who believe should and must stand up, stand tall, and strongly voice your concern. It should concern all of us regarding the riotous, seditious violence that occurred in our nation capital, and why the individual who desecrated it were treated differently than the manner the Black Lives Matter group who peacefully protested in Washington, D.C. last summer were treated. The rioters were not extremists for love and justice. They appeared to be extremists for hate and injustice. Don't stand idly by, Ed King insisted. We must continue to fight injustice because as the gospel song goes, we come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. We can't turn around. We can't turn around because we come this far by faith. Dr. King alluded to humiliating racial signs in stores window in Birmingham. I remember witnessing the same in my hometown store window growing up. I recall an instant of separate but clearly not equal. It was a time when our father took my brother, my younger brother and I, with him to the country store to purchase some item for a project he was working on. Like some younger kid at that time, as soon as you get somewhere they have to use the bathroom. It never fails. So my brother 
had to use the bathroom at the store where we was at. But the only usable bathroom was marked white. So my brother wanted to use that one. The ones that were marked colored were filthy as though it hadn't been cleaned and sanitized for a while. By the way, the water fountain were also the same. I could see that my father was speaking to the general store owner, but was unable to hear what was being said. The general store owner said no. Instantly, our father just through his lived experiences in the South, knew that it was time for us to leave. Our father turned around and rushed us to the car and took my brother down a nearby country road behind a cornfield so my brother could do his business. My friends, it's hard to follow Jesus, but as a friend of mine once said to me, nothing fails but a try because if you don't try something, you will surely never fail. At time, you may feel discouraged when you continue to see barriers, for example, like some of the ones I experienced growing up and more. Voter disenfranchisement experienced by King and his followers were visible then and they are still being experienced by people today particularly minority, low income, the elderly, and disabled urban individual for their still constitutional right equally and fairly cast their vote without fright. 58 years later, we have to fight that despair and not give in nor give up when you think the odds are against you. Surely the odds were against Dr. King and his followers, and they were even chastised for using children in Birmingham Crusade. Like Christ, we will be abhorred and despised, but, but don't give in to negativism regarding your willingness to make a difference because you will be rewarded by God in all of his welcoming graces as were heard in our scripture reading this morning. Stand up for what you think is right because the time is now. Sisters and brothers, there can ever be no better a time or chance to do so than right now. I ask that you please close your eyes for a few moments and doing so Listen deeply to your hearts. I want you to visualize the tens of thousands of people rightfully marching in protest over the unjust behavior of the Minneapolis Police Department, racial inequality leading to the murder of Mr. Floyd last May. They were not only protesting Mr. Floyd killing but though of so many others, social and racial injustices all over the country and the world. What did you see and hear over the news and social media outlet following the execution? Disregard, if you will, the behavior of those who were burning and looting our beautiful cities, but focus on the quiescent protesting a multitude, singing in unison, and carrying non-derogatory signs. The protesters were of various races, sex, creed, nationalities, representing the makeup of America itself. They were young and old and disabled, even those in wheelchairs and walkers many carrying peaceful social justice and human rights signs, such as Black Lives Matter, We Love You Joy, Justice for Joy, and Voting Right Protection signs, Job signs, and others. Now switch your mind and heart, if you would, to imagine that time in Birmingham, Alabama, and 
April 1963. Remembering excerpt from King's letter, the crowd, mostly African-American, the poor, the middle class, children, and some whites. They were also protesting social justice, racial inequality, and human rights issues. Some of the same social justice issues of today. Visualize, if you will, the vicious dogs attacking and, and scaring some of the children, the elderly, as well as the women. They did not discriminate. Policemen smashing the protester with buddy club. The fire department using high pressure water hoses. And whoever were in the reach of their might. As a retired firefighter, I know what damage firsthand these fire hoses can inflict on you, the children and women and the elderly yelling and crying, knocked to the ground in a racist society, expectation and hopes can be acknowledged as one of the greatest leaders of disappointment. You can open your eyes now. Moving forward, what do we do? We have hope and we have faith. And do so by leaning on the Lord and you trusting in his holy word. He would never fail you yet. The violence in Birmingham was a fear tactic supported by the local police, elected officials, city, county, and state level to maintain the status quo, segregation. But what happened when the violence attack on the protesters and the children were broadcast throughout the nation and the world? Remember, 58 years later, the end time killing of Mr. Floyd was also broadcast to the nation and the world via the smartphone. Did the broadcast bring about sufficient horror to give rise to the landmark 1964 Civil Rights Act? The fast forward now to January 6, 2021. Did the violence to a broadcast live on TV give rise to more violence? Or will this be the moment when new leadership exposes and address the disparity that too few of us have worked to dismantle throughout our professional lives? Did the hate overcome the love? Will love be the path? There is no embarrassment in being privileged. It's what you do with that privilege that counts and eventually determine who you are and whether you fit the role of a faithful servant and practicing civil disobedience, using nonviolent direct action and not riotous behavior. Perhaps the words of the late Congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis make it clear. We should never give in and never give up. We should always keep our eyes on the prize. While doing so, my sisters and brothers, be kind to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain.